Good morning, Trinity Church. It's good to be with you this morning in worship again, and welcome to all of you and to our guests, to those online and at Emmanuel Home. May the Lord bless us as we lift His name high in praise together, and that's indeed our, our desire. There's a few things to note from the bulletin. Um, there's a prayer meeting on Thursday evening, and uh, we'll probably spend a significant amount of time praying for the situation in the Ukraine, which of course is on a lot of our hearts, probably everybody's heart to some degree, and uh, certainly seems like I should be having a sermon on something about that today instead of sex, but the series is what it is at this point, and Lent starts next week. We just talked about that in the council room. Somebody's phone's going to ring. <laughs> anyway, it's not 10 o'clock yet, so it's okay. Um, also, just uh, encourage you to be in prayer for and uh, attend, if you can, the wedding of Deanna and Matt on Saturday, and uh, you look forward to a good time of worship with them, and uh, encourage you to encourage them as they make their vows together before God and His people. And then uh, the Vine, that's the young adults group, is meeting right after church. Uh, they're meeting at the Candid Coffee place, and uh, so they'll go from there for some outing of some kind, so if you have any questions about that, you can uh, text Pastor Hillary, I'm sure. Uh, we just want to encourage all of you to think about small groups again. I know that some of you have signed up for that, and others of you have uh, been waiting for a chance to jump in maybe a little bit later, and this might be a good chance for you to jump in. There's uh, several groups, lots of good groups that are going, and different times of the day, different um, days of the week. So if you have a desire to be in a small group, and I encourage everybody to do that, just give me a call this week, and we'll try to find a place that fits good for you, and so that you can take part in that. And basically what you can do is just kind of try it out for the next uh, six, seven weeks as we go through Lent. So that will be uh, looking at the armor of God from Ephesians 6 with your Bible study group. So I encourage you again to uh, take that to heart and consider it seriously and uh, prayerfully. Uh, just a reminder, I know we all hate these masks, um, but Edmonton still has a city bylaw masking thing, so even though it's going to be exempt in the province as of Tuesday, uh, we're still required in the city to wear them, and so we, unless we hear otherwise this week, we would uh, encourage you to keep those on at church next week as well. So I hope the city changes their mind, but until they do, we have to abide by those rules. So with that in mind... Let's uh, gear our hearts to the Lord, and uh, there's lots of things on our minds and our hearts this morning, I'm sure, as we think about everything going on in the world, and so we want to just kind of narrow our minds down to God and uh, focusing on Him and His grace for us and His call to us to live for Him and to trust Him with our lives. So I invite you to stand at this time for the opening prayer and the call to worship. And I should have mentioned as well, we do have Lord's Supper this morning, so if you didn't get a little cup, sneak out and grab one off the back table there uh, during a song. Let's uh, turn to God's Word and hear what He has to say to us as He uh, draws us to Himself and reminds us with these words from Jesus. Father, the time has come. Glorify Your Son that Your Son may glorify You. And that is indeed the desire of Jesus as he lived his life, and it should be our desire. And so let's pray to him to do that. Heavenly Father, as we gather in worship this morning, our minds are filled with all kinds of things that the world has brought to our attention. We live in a world of chaos, and we are mindful of the Ukraine situation and, and what the implications for that could be for ourselves even, and, but particularly for that part of the world. And we pray, Lord, for your grace for us now to focus our hearts on you, to pray for your church everywhere around the world, that people will know your presence and peace in the midst of the storm. And we pray, Lord, that now our hearts would be lifted to you and that you would be glorified as Jesus prayed. In your name we pray. Amen. Dear friends of the Lord, he greets us with these words. Grace, mercy, and peace to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people say, Amen. Let's worship him. Oh 
As God's people, let's bow before Him and acknowledging our sin and His holiness and uh, His graciousness to us as well. Let's pray. Almighty God in heaven, how infinite is Your love and Your grace and Your domain. The world is Yours and we belong to You. We are called to follow You and we seek to do that through the power of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit in us. And yet we recognize that sin still clings to us, though we are saved, redeemed, washed clean, and though we know that, yet we continue to live selfishly at times. We lack concern for others in the world when their plight is so far much, so much far worse than ours. And we pray, Lord, for forgiveness of that, of self-love and self-concern while others are struggling and hurting. We pray that for people whose situation and uh, understanding of life is different than ours as well, Lord, whose struggles are different than ours. We pray, Lord, that we will have a heart for them as well, and we pray for forgiveness for the times when, when we ignore the needs of others and just go about our own business. Father, thank you for your grace to us, and thank you for the promise of your love that is full and free. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The words of John 8 come to mind as Jesus was talking to the woman who had been accused of committing adultery, and uh, people were accusing her of being a terrible person and all kinds of things and trying to stone her to death, and Jesus, of course, had compassion on her and uh, got rid of all the people that were trying to accuse her, and the Bible says Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. And so the Lord Jesus, again, full of grace for us, says the same thing to us. Neither do I condemn you. Because Romans tells us that he bore the condemnation for us so that we will not be condemned. We are free because he bore the, the weight of sin. And so we thank God for his grace to us through Jesus. And we pray that by the Spirit's power, we will likewise, as he told the woman, go and leave the sin of our lives behind us and follow him. Let's sing in thanksgiving, yet not I, but through Christ in me, and we'll remain in our seats for that.
boys and girls, stand up. There you go. Okay, we're going to do something. You know the hokey pokey? You know it? Yeah, okay. Let's do it. You put your right hand in, you put your right hand out, you put your right hand in, and you shake it all about. You do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself around. That's what it's all about. What's the next verse? Put your left hand in, you put your left hand out, you put your left hand in, and you shake it all about. You do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself around. That's what it's all about. Then what? Okay, right foot. Put your right foot in, you put your right foot out, you put your right foot in, and you shake it all about. You do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself around. <laughs> That's what it's all about. Okay, now we're going to do the left foot, but pretend you don't have a right foot. Will that work? That will not work, will it? You need two legs to do that. You can sit down. When we don't have all of our body parts, sometimes things don't work well, right? So doing the hokey pokey with one leg doesn't work. You'll fall down. You can do it with one arm, sort of, but you can't do the one arm. But anyway, you, you get the idea, right? And the Bible talks about the church as a body. And that every part is important. So kids are important, adults are important, grandparents are important, boys are important, girls are important. Everybody's important, young people, old people. We're all important. It doesn't matter if we have a disability or not, we're still important. We're, we belong in the body. That's what the Bible says. And so we want to think about that more today, but we want to remember that Jesus is the one who's the head of the body. We, we're all the parts, so I might be a finger or a toe, and you might be something different, an eyeball or an ear, and they're all important. But we all need each other in order for the whole body to function well, but most of all, we need the head. And that, in the Bible's language, the head is Jesus. And Jesus is the one who gives life to the whole body. He's the one who strengthens the whole body. He's the one who directs the whole body. And so that's what we need to remember as Christians, is that we listen to Jesus. We follow Him, and we get our strength from Him to live as we should, encouraging one another, being supportive of one another, because every part's important, and every part plays a role. And so we can all together be all that Jesus wants us to be, with His strength and His power and His presence. So praise be to Jesus for that. We're going to sing a children's song now, O oh God, You Are My God. We'll stand and sing, and at the end of that, boys and girls, you can leave for we worship. leave for we worship. Mary Van Rijk is going to come up and she's going to lead us in prayer.
Shall we pray? Gracious God, we honor and praise you every and each day you give us time with you in our busy lives to pray and serve you. Be with our church. We thank you for your word which is brought to us every week again. Be with Pastor Rich as he brings your word today and that it may touch our hearts. We pray for our church family. Be with Pastor Michael and Christy and their family. We pray for your blessing on the marriage of Deanna and Matt. Be with those who are not well and struggling with cancer. Be with Luke, Janine, Janelle, Pat, Brian, and Marvin. We pray especially today for Peter O'Dine's sister, Gerda, who has been diagnosed this week with cancer. Lay your comforting and healing hands on them. Be with Bill and Herman and Corey and Anne who are looked after in care homes. Stir the hearts of our members in the nomination process for new council members. And in that process, we reach out to one another through small group ministry. We thank you for the freedom in difficult times of pandemic and unrest in the world. We come to you today with heavy hearts as we see the war in the Ukraine. We pray that you would be merciful on the people of the Ukraine and Russia. Grant wisdom to world leaders to effectively stop evil. Allow for the truth to be known, for lies to be shown for what they are and for the evildoers to be thwarted. Lord, we pray for those who have already lost loved ones homes and livelihoods. Comfort, provide for needs of those who have been displaced. Lord, we ask for mercy and we seek justice. We pray that you will, would be at work in both. We pray for the day when all wars will cease and when your peaceful reign will come fully. But in the meantime, we pray that you would use us to fa facilitate the coming of your kingdom here and now. Help us to take action to bring peace, to care for the victims of war, and to work for justice. Help us to live according to the principles of your kingdom today and remain faithful until your kingdom comes fully at your return. Grant courage to your church in Russia, in the Ukraine, and here to speak truth to power and to prophetically proclaim the truths of your kingdom as well as the day of grace that still remains for those who repent. Lord, we pray for the Prime Minister of Russia. O oh Lord, we pray that you will change his heart and work your miracle of salvation in his life. If he continues in his wicked ways, we pray that you would restrain his evil and his, have mercy on those who suffer because of it. In all these things, we trust you because you are our loving Father. We ask that we would keep our faithful, us faithful by the power of your spirit and that you would be with your church in the Ukraine, that in times of war, it would faithfully follow you and represent you before the nations. Heal the wounds, we pray, both physical and the wounds of the heart. Reconcile the nations with you and with each other by the power of the cross of our reigning Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Well, today we're doing part two of Let's talk about sex, and this time we're going to talk about those who don't have sex. And if you listen to our Bible reading from 1 Corinthians 6 and 7, you might be surprised at all the instructions 
Paul gives for singleness and abstinence, and I'm going to skip some of the verses in those two chapters to keep us more focused on singleness, but feel free to read it in its entirety later because it's all good. We just have limited time. So I'm going to start uh, at verse 15. It says verse 12 up there. I changed it a little bit. Sorry. Um, So we'll start at verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Now chapter 7, verse 1. Now for the matters you wrote about, and Paul quotes there, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. Verse 5, do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all of you were as I am, single, unmarried, probably a widower. But each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now to the unmarried, or the widowers and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Then we skip to verse 25. Now about virgins, I have no command from the Lord, but I give you a judgment as one who, by the Lord's mercy, is trustworthy. Now just note that when Paul speaks like this, he's speaking as an apostle, without knowing that his words will later become part of the Bible. So he's giving what he considers godly counsel, and that counsel through the work of the Holy Spirit and the church has become the inspired word of God. And so we read in verse 26, because of the present crisis, growing persecution, I think that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you pledged to a woman? Do not seek to be released. Are you free from such a commitment? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned, and if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. And verse 29, 32, sorry, verse 32. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone is worried that he might not be acting honorably toward a virgin he is engaged to, and if he His passions are too strong and he feels he ought to marry. He should do as he wants. He is not sinning. They should get married. But the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion but has control over his own will, and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man also does the right thing. So then, he who marries the virgin does right, but he who does not marry her does better. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. In my judgment, she is happier if she stays as she is, which is single, and I think that I too have the Spirit of God. This is the word of the Lord. Now before I begin my sermon, I want to invite a familiar face to come forward. She's going to introduce herself. 
and, uh, but I think most of us know her. So we thank you in advance for coming up and for being vulnerable with us, and we cherish this gift, so come on up. Good morning. I'm Linda Rosendahl, if you don't know who I am. Interesting, interestingly enough, um, the day before Pastor Rich asked me to speak about singleness, I listened to his presentation on, human sexuality, on the Human Sexuality Report. And that got me thinking about my life as a single person. I think, I think the Holy Spirit was at work, and that's what brings me here today. This is my church. I love this church and I served here and I do serve here in many different capacities. The one thing that makes me feel somewhat disconnected in this church is that I'm single. I have not been married, nor do I have any children. So much of the church revolves around couples, marriage and family. So sometimes it's hard to know where you fit in as a single person. Growing up, I dreamed of being married and having children now I wonder at times, am I unblessed because I haven't had a child? Having a child, especially a son, seems to be equated with a sign of blessing in the Old Testament. Likewise, am I unblessed because I haven't been in a serious relationship or haven't been in an intimate relationship with anyone? I have met many people and they ask me how many kids I have. I say none, I'm not married. Though sadly in our society today, Marriage doesn't seem to be necessary before having children. In any event, when I say I'm not married and have no kids, sometimes people give me a strange look and say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> or they say, that's too bad. Sometimes that hurts because that's what I've dreamed of my whole life, being a wife, being a mother. Sometimes it worries me because I think of the future. Who's going to take care of me? That's worrisome, not, not always but it's something I think about. Because marriage is almost exalted in the church as a normal and expected state of someone, I often thought, what do others in the church think of me for not being married, not having a husband and children? On the flip side, when I was an elder, I thought, how can I serve as, as an elder and relate to what families of my care group are going through? How can I help people with relationship issues and marriage struggles when I myself as a single person haven't experienced such things. Maybe that's why I struggled with myself for thinking I'm not a good elder. I know in my heart that isn't true, but my head tells me different sometimes. I know I can serve God in many different ways and I continue to do that with love in my heart and service to him. It has opened my eyes as to how, how others may feel and that they don't belong in the church for whatever reason they have and how can we make them feel accepted and active participants in our congregation? I have been a member of Trinity Church since it opened. I grew up in this church. I have served in many capacities as nursery attendant, Sunday school teacher, Calvinette counselor, that was a long time ago, deacon, elder. I've served on praise and worship teams. I've been a photographer at prayer summits. I have volunteered with the Joyful Noise Choir for over 30 years. I have, uh, I lead the friendship group at Covenant Church on Monday nights. I'm a disability concerns advocate for Classes Alberta North. I have and continue to serve our church and denomination in many ways. And all of these ways have been enriching for me and I trust a blessing for those I've served and worked alongside with. So I know I belong here at Trinity, but being single has meant I've perhaps had to try a little harder in a place where marriage and family is the common pattern for life. The odd time I've come to accept some people's unkind remarks, understanding that they didn't mean anything malicious by them. They just don't understand singleness like I do. Many of my friends are married couples. When I participate in activities, camping, golfing trips, I'm the odd woman out. The fact that not all my friends recognize this hurts sometimes and I choose not to participate because I don't want them to feel bad or uncomfortable because of me. 
On the flip side, I'm grateful for married friends who understand my situation and make good efforts to help me feel at home with them. In the end, I'm blessed to be who I am and to have been given many different roles to play in the life of the church and the broader ministries of the kingdom of God. I strongly believe and am comforted in knowing that God had other plans for me and my life other than marriage and family. I have been and continue to be blessed in the church, in my family, with my friends, and in my work. My ways of belonging and fitting in are different than for people who are married or have families, but I value the life God has given me and found joy in serving the Lord as a single person. I love Jeremiah 29, 11, which says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Since God plan, God's plans are good, this helps me move forward in faith that God has important roles for me to fill as a single person. My sister always said I'm her boy's second mom, and that makes me feel good that when they can feel comfortable when they need me and they know they can depend on me. I have 50 kids in the Joyful Noise Choir every season, and I can show and teach my love of singing, teach what it takes to belong in a choir, to work together, encourage them to sing in their own church, which praises our God. I have my friendship students and friendship group who show unconditional love. I get to share the love of Jesus with them and show them that they are children of God, just like me. Every summer for the past 30 some years, I enjoy the campers at Rehoboth Camp. I get to meet their families, um, give the parents a week off, teach the campers that God loves them and have fun with them. At the same time, I get to teach and build up young volunteers, helping them see what it's like to serve God in working with other children of God. In short, my life is filled with kids and people whom I love and who love me back. The biggest part of all of this is love. That is what God commands us. When someone asked Jesus, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus told him, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important commandment. The second is exactly like it. You must love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. I'm thankful for God, how, for how God has showed, has loved me himself and allowed me to experience love through many Christians, including many in this church. I know I am part of the family of God who binds us all together and helps us to love him above all and to love each other. Whether we are single or married, have kids or not, we belong to Christ and to one another. We were all the same in terms of needing God's love and the love of others. Thankfully, God knows how to meet our every need, and I pray that we will always be ready to keep learning how to love everyone to the best of our abilities. Thanks. Thank you, Linda. You are loved, and we're thankful that you're part of our family. Congregation, we heard last week that sex is God's gift to married couples. And Paul makes it clear in the verses we read today that that's important. But we should not overlook the truth that not being married is a high honor in the Bible, higher than we may often attribute to it. I will just start this sermon by saying to everyone who is single that the church in general, and even this church in particular, has all too often exalted marriage to the point that it is sold as the best of all lives for everybody. A good Christian girl should grow up and marry a good Christian boy, and they should have good Christian children, and preferably a dozen. Well, maybe not a dozen. But you get the picture. I hope that everyone who is married is thinking, oh, wait a minute, marriage is good. It is. But what have I told you that being single is also a good life? Yes, even a good and a God-pleasing life. This is an important Bible teaching that we need to affirm and act on. 
Today, then, I'm going to give some biblical backing for the exalted view of singleness and then some practical ways that we can bless our single members. Now, the passage we read from 1 Corinthians brings a new light to discipleship, a light that was not really present so much in the Old Testament. Singleness is given high value in the New Testament, whereas in the Old, to be unmarried, to be without children, was to be not blessed. Think of people like Sarah, the wife of Abraham, who could not conceive. Think of Hannah, the prophet Samuel's mother, who also felt inadequate, felt unfulfilled because she didn't have a child, a son in particular. Couples who didn't have children were undervalued because children were your inheritance. Their culture considered them deficient or incomplete, if not cursed by God. So when we get to the New Testament, it should not be lost on us that Jesus exalts women just as he tends to exalt all those who are down and out. Among his followers during his ministry years were the 12 men disciples, but many women are listed as followers and supporters of Jesus' ministry. Some are men, some are women, but some were married and some were single. Whether single or married, they had equal callings in the work of the Lord that Jesus was doing. However, as Paul suggests in 1 Corinthians, the singles could devote themselves to the work of the Lord without being distracted by obligations of marriage and family. Paul's conviction about singleness seems to have been heightened by the fact that persecution was growing in that time. He clearly has his heart on that thought in verse 26 when he says, because of this present crisis, which refers to persecution, I think it is good for a man to remain as he is, single. However, singleness doesn't automatically make one a better disciple of Jesus. Paul's point is that it gives a Christian the opportunity to be a more devoted disciple of Jesus. Discipleship is the key here for Paul. In verse 35, he says, I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way of undivided devotion to the Lord. It appears that Paul was married at some point and that his wife had since passed away. So he could speak with experience as a married man previously and as a single man presently. He clearly suggests singleness is preferable for the sake of the gospel and particularly because of the persecution. He did indeed give his life fully to the work of the gospel as a disciple. He never had to worry about his wife while he was out on dangerous missions, while he was out showing the love of Jesus and preaching the gospel of Jesus. He was not concerned about his family. His undivided devotion to the Lord helped him to serve the Lord and his church better. Hence his words to the church in Philippi are, Philippians 1 verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Paul was always eager to serve the Lord. He was recommending singleness, but don't get me wrong. I don't want to be single. I like my wife. I don't actually relate very well to Paul here. I happen to personally think that I'd be less of a pastor and less of a preacher if it wasn't for Patsy. I'm thankful to be married. She is a distraction, as Paul said, but a good one. I don't know what I would have done in 30 years of ministry without her. I don't know if I would have survived. I do know that she encourages me and gives me valuable feedback on my work. She's a good sounding board for me. She takes good care of me, making sure I eat well and exercise. But above all, she's my best friend and co-worker in Christ. In fact, she helps me love Jesus more. And that's not to take away from what Paul is saying, because that's exactly Paul's point. Not about a spouse, but about Jesus. We need to love Jesus. He needs to be the, the heart of every person. And if you're married, the heart of your marriage. We hear in different ways as we read 1 Corinthians 13 that Paul is not against, or 1 Corinthians, the whole book rather, not just 13. 
that Paul is not against marriage. Rather, he's saying there's a higher calling in life for those who are willing to embrace it, who can embrace it. Paul could have said, let Jesus be your spouse. And again, not to take anything away from marriage, but human relationships, friends, are temporary. They are. We, we like to think, oh, I'm going to go see my husband or wife when, when I die and join them in heaven. And I, I don't know that you won't see them or know them, but you won't be connected through marriage. Our connection in the life to come is with Jesus. And that's what Paul is saying is possible now already for those who choose singleness. It, this is the best life for anybody to be connected fully to Jesus. And so he's saying this is the life that single people can pursue more in this life than married people because single people are not distracted, as he says. Now please understand, Paul isn't saying choose singleness and that's it. He is saying if you feel called by God, choose singleness, singleness so that you can devote more of your life to serving and loving the Lord. It is honorable for the sake of the gospel to forsake marriage in order to focus on Jesus and his kingdom without distraction because that's what it will be like in eternity when Jesus is our all in all. Some married people right now are thinking, really? Is that going to be better? I, I like my wife and I, I like my wife. But one writer put it very helpfully. I thought, said, the things we value in this life are valued because they are a foretaste of things we are made for. It is as if I have a particularly glorious painting of mountains that I am totally smitten with. I love looking at those snow-capped peaks on my picture, the majestic grandeur of the mountains themselves. I love this painting. But now we are moving. And I am told I cannot take this painting with me for some reason that I do not understand. That makes no sense to me. I just can't have it. And I am inconsolable. I hate the idea of moving to this new place where I can't have my mountains. The part I don't comprehend is that my new home, this is American writing, I guess, is in western Wyoming or in Montana or in the Alps or because we're in Alberta, in Banff, or Jasper. I had to leave my picture behind. But the exchange is the real thing. And marriage is a picture of the real thing. The life of single-hearted devotion to Jesus. So those who choose singleness in order to pursue Jesus are actually pursuing the real thing. They are pursuing a relationship that will never be taken away from them and a kingdom that does not spoil, perish, or fade. Marriage is a good part of creation. Following Jesus is also important. And so following Jesus with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength is the highest calling of every Christian. So I'm not saying that marriage is bad. It's good. God said it's good. But the Bible is saying that being single for the sake of being a more devoted disciple of Jesus is a noble choice. And it's one that the church and all of us who are disciples of Jesus must take seriously and support. So let's switch gears. Maybe you're married and think that what I've said is crazy. Well, you wouldn't be the first one that thought I was crazy. But the truth is that Jesus does enable us to do some things that people think are crazy. You tell some people that you give 10% of your money to the church for ministry, and they'll say, you're crazy. You tell them you give five hours, maybe more of your time a week, to serving the Lord in some capacity or his kingdom, and they'll say, you're crazy. You could be watching a hockey game. You pay extra money to send your kids to Christian school? You're crazy. It's free. You abstain from sex till marriage? Well, lots of people in our society would think you're crazy. 
Now, think about some practical ways that we can value singleness if this is one of the things God says we should do. I want to invite you all into this life of craziness, if you will. Craziness in the name of supporting single people as part of the body of Christ. Paul's words in our reading encourage people to consider singleness for the sake of Jesus and the gospel, but not everyone who is single has chosen to be single. Often singleness has chosen them. They may have had desires and dreams about marriage, but God had other plans. And Linda did a beautiful job of explaining that. And those plans include living as a single for them. Now, whether a person chooses singleness for the sake of Jesus or is single for some other reason, no one should be alone. Being single and being alone don't have to be the corresponding sides of a coin. Paul wasn't suggesting that single people would be without community and not experience love. We are not created to be alone. We are we may have chosen not to marry or we simply end up not finding a spouse, but every person still needs community and we are encouraged by God to ensure that, that we value every person in the church. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul speaks of the church as a body, as I alluded to in the children's message, the body of Christ. He explains that every person has a role to play. Every person fits in. Every person belongs in one way or another. And that needs to be the case whether a person is single or married, young or old, black, brown, white, heterosexual, or LBGTQ. This is the challenge in our day, friends. More people are single today than in the past. More young adults are staying single longer than in the previous generations. More people are coming out as LBGTQ, and, and if their situation requires celibacy, we need to be the body of Christ for them in a special way. More people are living longer. That means that many of our seniors are not only losing a spouse, but are living longer themselves as a widow or a widower. That requires special attention. Without being too exact about it, if you really stop and think about it, a huge segment of the church is single. All our children, all our young people, young adults, until they're married. Then there are people who were married but are no longer married, whether because of divorce or the death of their spouse. Just our single seniors alone is over 80 people in this church. Singleness is not some abnormality that we can ignore. A large segment of the church is made up of single people, unmarried people. Whenever I think about singleness, particularly widows, there's one old lady I saw years ago. She's not so old anymore because I'm older now. but <laughs> She was really old back then. And she used to say to me every time I visited her, yeah, pastor, alone is alone. And she meant it. She was lonely. But singleness should not mean loneliness. I heard a single man recently say, if there's one thing I would love from my church, it's knowing there's a place I can go once a week to have dinner with a family or a group of people. He's, not lo he's longing for connection, for genuine fellowship over a meal. He doesn't want to have to call or wait for a call for an invitation. He wants to feel there's a place where he is always welcome. So just think about that for a moment. How could we begin to answer the call of this person or other single people who want to feel like they belong among us? Let me give you a few suggestions. Maybe you're a person who loves cooking. Maybe you want to do it every Tuesday, for example. But you could have a meal for this young man. And Anybody else who wants to drop in and just make it known one way or another that every Tuesday is come as you are dinner at my house. And you might want to say you got to let me know a day in advance so you can plan, but, but you get the picture. Just open your heart, open your doors, open your kitchen, and you can be a huge blessing to just one single person or maybe more. This is something you don't even have to do by yourself. You can partner with other people. 
have a meal at a different place each week. Maybe the same place, but maybe one of you can cook every week and another can set up and everyone else can clean up, but whatever. You could do this even here at the church. This is, the idea is that we give single people a place to feel connected consistently, a place that fills a need in their life so they don't feel alone in a world that is filled with loneliness and particularly not alone as part of the church. They are connected and they are loved. Another option is small groups. I had a great meeting last week with our shepherding elders and small group leaders. You'll notice in the bulletin, and I mentioned it already, that there's an opportunity for you to jump into a small group in the next couple of weeks to try it out if you want for Lent. Small groups are a place to belong, to seek Jesus together. They are a great place for singles to plug in and for married people to make sure that singles feel included. Obviously, when singles are included, you don't make your Bible study about marriage or raising kids. But that goes without saying. That has its place, and it's, it's okay. But in a group where singles are is not the place for that. So stick to the thing that we all need from a small group, a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. We need fellowship and we need community that helps us know God's will for our lives, that encourages us to live for Him. We need a place where we can become all that God has designed us to be, where we encourage to be all that we can be, all that Jesus has died and risen to make us into. In short, we need a group that loves Christ and loves one another and helps us to become the best Christian, fully devoted to Jesus that we can be. A third practical important thing we can do is to normalize singleness. Instead of saying, we can't wait for your wedding day to your children, parents should say things like, our deepest desire for you, my child, is to follow Jesus, to be a devoted disciple of Jesus, whether you're married or single. You can even leave that last part off. Just let them know that that is your number one desire for them, Marriage is great, perhaps, but not for everybody. So don't set it up as the standard. And finally, we can continue to encourage sexual purity, living by God's standards for everyone in the church. Whether married or single, young or old, we must all practice self-control, and Paul alludes to that in sexual matters, but also in the rest of life. Not just sexual matters, Self-control is a part of everybody's life every day. We make choices every day about what to do and what not to do. We need self-control, and sometimes we need support when we do that, in order to do that. We must support our singles in this when it's tough for them to be sexually pure. We must be grace-filled. We must be loving as Jesus was to that woman who was caught in adultery. We must recognize the struggle that it can be for some people, just as Paul does in our reading over and over. He he highlights the struggle. Again, I think small groups can play a part in helping us support one another for sexual purity, for overcoming loneliness, and just overall help and living for the glory of God. In conclusion, church, it is good to remember that our Lord Jesus never got married. He knew the struggle of being alone, even abandoned. And Hebrews 4 tells us that he understands and is able to sympathize with us in our struggles. Moreover, he has made it possible for us to belong to him, belong to God, and to belong to one another. He forgives our sins, hallelujah. But he also helps us in our weaknesses and in our struggles, whether singles or married, regardless of our age and regardless of our circumstances. And a big way that Jesus does this as the head of the church is through the church, his body. In Christ, we are all brought into the family of God. We are sons and daughters of God. We are brothers and sisters in Jesus. And on top of that, together the church is the bride of Christ. He is our loving and ever faithful groom. He loves us with selflessness and all giving love. He draws us to himself in love and gives us to one another to help us know His love and to enjoy 
the fellowship or the communion of the saints through the church family. This is what our Savior does for us. Jesus prayed before going to the cross, a prayer recorded in John 17, where he said, Father, I pray that all who believe in me will be one. Congregation, may we all do what we can in the power of Jesus to make sure that each and every member of the church knows they belong, that they are part of the one body, and they know the loving embrace of Jesus and the unity he gives to us. Oneness is in him. Oneness is in him. May we thank him for our single members and all the ways that they serve Jesus and us. Think back to Linda's story, the countless different ways that she's contributed to the body of Christ in her life. Not lost on the Lord and deepening her own faith. And let's ensure that we honor and support each person as a dear, valued, and loved part of this church. When all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Let's respond by singing together, you, Who You Say I Am. I invite you to stand for that, and we'll remain standing after that song to confess our faith together. you sing your heart out and I'll preach when he said you're gonna preach your heart out I said yeah it'll be on the floor and I'm done so that's what he just picked up and put it back
stay standing for a second, and we'll confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Say with me, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life Beloved in Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus instituted the sacrament of Holy Communion, saying, do this in remembrance of me. In obedience to that command, we now celebrate this memorial feast. We therefore invite all of you who have confessed your Lord and have truly examined yourself as the Apostle Paul commanded to come in repentance and assurance of faith to commune with Christ in these earthly elements. As we draw near, let us acknowledge that our Lord has instituted this supper so that by it we may remember him and be nourished and refresh, he will refresh us to eternal life. To observe this holy supper in remembrance of him is to proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again. In partaking of this supper, therefore, we remember that our Lord Jesus was our Savior promised in the Old Testament, that he is the eternal and only begotten Son of God, that he assumed our human nature in which he fulfilled for us all obedience and righteousness, and that he bore for us the wrath of God under which we should have perished forever. We remember that he was bound that we might be loosed from our sins, that he was innocently condemned to death, that we might be acquitted at the judgment seat of God, that he became a curse for us to fulfill all of our lives with, and to fill us with blessing and that he humbled himself on the cross to hell's deep agony, which wrung from him the cry, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me, that God might never forsake us? We remember that he was buried to sanctify the grave for us, that he was raised for our justification, that he is exalted at God's right hand, and that he will come again to judge the living and the dead. And we remember that the shedding of his blood has confirmed for us a new and eternal testament, the covenant of grace. In addition to all this, by the Spirit who dwells in Christ as in the head and in us as his members, he brings us into true communion with himself and makes us all partakers of his riches, of eternal life, righteousness, and glory. By the same Spirit, he causes us together with all true believers to be united as members of one body. As the Holy Apostle says, we who are many, are one body, for we all partake of one loaf. So let us eat and drink of this gift that the Lord has given to us. And before we do that, let us pray. Merciful God and Father, whose grace abounds beyond all our sins, we pray that in this supper, in which we commemorate the death of your dear Son, we pray that you will work in our hearts, that we may yield ourselves ever more fully to Jesus Christ, to be more devoted disciples. May our contrite hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit be nourished and refreshed with Jesus' body and blood, with him, true God and true man, the only heavenly bread, so that we may no longer live in our sin, but he in us and we in him. Confirm us in your covenant of grace, so that we may not doubt that you will forever be our gracious God, no more imputing our sin to us, but abundantly providing us with all things necessary for body and soul as your dear children and heirs. Grant us your grace that we may cheerfully take up our cross, deny our sinful selves, confess our Savior, and in all the temptations and trials of this life expect our Lord Jesus from heaven to strengthen us. For Jesus at his coming will make our mortal bodies like his glorified body and take us to himself in eternity. 
Answer us, O God and merciful Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit belong all the praise and adoration now and forevermore. Amen. Friends in the Lord, the bread which we break is a communion in the body of Christ. Our oneness in him is found in this. I invite you to take your little wafer out of the top of your package. And now take, eat, remember and believe the body of the Lord Jesus Christ was broken for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. Friends, the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks is a memory, a commemoration, and a unity with Christ who shed his blood for us. Again, open your cups. And let us together take, drink, remember, and believe that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ was shed for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. Join me once again in prayer. Merciful God and Father, we thank you that with all our heart, for your boundless grace, you have touched us and united us through your Son to be our mediator and a sacrifice for all our sins, food and drink unto eternal life. We thank you for giving us true faith through which we can partake of these gifts, your benefits. Fill us powerfully, Holy Spirit. Strengthen our faith, we pray. May this supper increase our faith and enrich our fellowship with Christ and also our fellowship with one another. May it be another way in which we are united as the body of Christ with Jesus our head. We thank you and praise you, O God, for your gifts to us in every member of our church. And we pray that your love and your light that is given to us, even in this means of grace, may strengthen us to be love and light in this world more and more. Lord, continue your work of strengthening us in our faith and growing us more into the likeness of Christ until we meet with you in the blessed fellowship that all your children will be gathered in and share in the joy of our full salvation. Hear us, Heavenly Father, in Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Would you please stand for the words of response of thanksgiving from Psalm 103 that will be on the screen. Say these words with me. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As Father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Praise the Lord for all his works. Everywhere Let us sing, lift up your hearts unto the Lord.
as you leave, please give up your gifts to the Lord, either in the back tables or when you get home on your phone or in the car, wherever you do that. And uh, just give to the gracious work of the Lord here at Trinity, and uh, also for Nick and Jocelyn Frey with Mission Aviation Fellowship, who have, uh, now are based in Canada, but continue to support the worldwide work of Mission Av Aviation Fellowship. So give as the Lord has blessed you and as he puts on your heart. Now receive God's parting blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you and strengthen you now and always, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Let's sing. Thank you.